It's there. Flag. Flag. He's in the jug. In two, in Reach a, up. You're he, there. Yeah. He flags, and then he yeah. unflags, and he reaches up, and he's in the clipping jug. And then mm-hmm. you step over. Instead and of, you didn't have to use any bad feet. Yeah. And you skip all of the holes that Alex Magos used and clipped off of. <laughs> yeah. In this episode, we dive into Michael's send of China Beach. We talk about how he went from climbing 512 to feeling ready to try a 14B. Then we switch gears and break down the route with video to really give you a feel for what it's like to climb on it. We talk about how Michael got really into training and what a typical week looked like. We talk about how he refined his beta for the route. Now, Michael has the most efficient beta I have ever seen on China Beach, and I've seen almost every video out there and many world-class climbers in person. It's really cool to see how much he still remembers over a decade later. Finally, we talk about what it felt like to send, and we attempt to unpack just what makes a hard project the right level of hard. Timestamps to each section are in the description, along with links to the video clips. By the end of this, I was even more psyched to get back on China Beach, and I hope you are as well. So, Michael, what's, uh, what's your last few days of training been like? Uh, good question. Very good question. So, I uh, hired Pachi Usubiaga as a coach. Um, and it has been great. I love his programs. I don't think that they're like crazy high volume, like everyone says. I think it seems fine. Mm-hmm. And so everything is building up to me going to rifle in a week. And uh, you know, mo- most of the time, there's very specific stuff to do. But for yesterday and today, the description was just to climb a muerte. So anytime you it. have a like an awesome <laughs> Spanish climber tell you to climb up where it's good so it's been awesome uh I, I love that i mean i i think of you as a training guru who's very oh, thank you uh very kind of detailed and experimental and rigorous and so it's quite funny to 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 hear your your current mandate is simply a <laughs> right 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 so let's dive in what should people know about you? What should people know about me? Yeah. <laughs> that, that's a good question. So, uh, I mean, for this podcast, I'm a rock climber. We're talking about China Beach. I guess I'm someone that's done China Beach. So that's cool. That's going to be my main purpose for this episode uh-huh. is not as co-host, but as a um, person that's being interviewed about China Beach, I think. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm a math professor. Uh, so I got my PhD in 2011 and I hopped around a bunch of different schools and now I'm like, uh, finally got tenure at a school in Virginia. So I'm based in Virginia now. My home crag is the new river gorge. And then I think I'm supposed to have one more thing. Oh, I've got kids and stuff. So I'm living the family life. So, um, I have two kids. One is six and one just turned 11 yesterday. Um, so I think those are three good things to know about me. Oh, on the math thing, let's go back to the math thing. I have a uh-huh, strangely yeah. popular math YouTube channel. I have almost 220,000 subscribers and about 37 million total views. <laughs> and in math internet circles, I'm quite well known. It is very strange. I am most familiar with the video you made when we were in Rifle last year where you solved the Gaussian integral while climbing Pumparama. Yeah, that uh, is true. That is true. I did <laughs> climb Pumparama with a whiteboard slung around my back. And when I got to the double knee bar, I did the Gaussian integral and then climbed to the top. It was one of the most difficult things I've ever done. <laughs> and as um, everybody around will attest, you definitely sent that Oh, I'm definitely. Sent that. <laughs> yeah, don't even worry about it. Don't think about that too hard. Uh. Don't think about what those cuts were about. Uh, <laughs> oddly, I thought that video was going to go super viral and get like a million views. I've got a couple of videos that have gone super viral and gotten like a million views. They're like silly geometry problems. I thought yeah. this stunt of me climbing 513 and doing math was going to go super viral, but it really didn't. Yeah, I, I definitely, I definitely thought it was going to go viral. But then again, I started this podcast on a single route with you. (laughs) And I'm pretty sure this episode will go viral. So there's that. 
Yeah, so there's hope. Uh, that's awesome. Yeah. So uh, for the purposes of this episode in which you are the sender of China Beach, you have been for a long time essentially a weekend warrior. As, as Dave McLeod oh, says, yeah. uh, beware the focused weekend warrior. Right. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> yeah, I'm a weekend of... warrior all of the time except for in the summer. So we'll, we'll dive Which into that. Which I guess that is it... like a huge privilege to not be one in the summer because most people have mm. jobs where they have to work in the summer. That is true. That is true. We'll, we'll dive into that later and like how that affects training because I think that's a really interesting topic by itself. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah um, for sure. Let's let's start at the beginning. You had just climbed five twelve, maybe twelve C at rifle, and you were about to move to the northeast. Or tell me how you that, first got into China Beach. That's right. So, um, okay, I started climbing when I was in grad school for the first time, like in a master's program in Indiana, um, and I would go to the Red. And then I moved to Arkansas for a year after that and got in with like this crew of Arkansas climbers, Warren Holsey, um, Alan Von Grimp, who listened to the first episode of this podcast. Hey, Alan. Um, hey, and Alan. A few, and a few others. And I, while I lived in Arkansas, I went up to the Red for uh, a little bit of time and I did Steelworker. So that was maybe my first 12C that I ever did. Um, it's super classic. It's kind of hard to do now because it's at Torrent Falls. And then I went to Rifle and did Promise and got totally shut down by Pretty Hate Machine. So, um, yeah, I was like essentially only climbing 12C uh, and not anything harder. And when I moved to Rumney or I moved to the Northeast to go to grad school in Albany and we climbed in Rumney the whole time. And... I worked through all the routes from the bottom. I mean, and it, starting at like 12B. Wait, do you remember the 12B? Yeah, I think techno was the first thing I did. Oh, that's... Okay, you have taste. The first, <laughs> the first 12A I did ever was Things As They Are Now, which is a V4 boulder problem with two bolts. And the second 12 I did was a 12B uh, Jedi Mind Tricks, I think. Uh, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Which is a V5 boulder problem with three bolts or something like that. Right. Well, you know, the, my sort of mentor before that was, like I said, this guy Warren Holsey in Arkansas, who now lives in Chattanooga. And he taught me of the, like, to pick quality routes. And so he guided me through which routes to climb in Arkansas. And then also he was at that trip and rifle. And. For those who don't know, techno surfing is one of the best 12 Bs. I'll just stop there. One of the best 12 Bs. Uh, I would it's agree. At, yeah, it's at Rumney. It is this, um, if you do it right, it's the standard warm up for a China Beach. Like techno surfing, uh, and then, um, wow, I'm blanking. What's the 12, 12 D uh, slash 13 A? Big Kahuna. Big Kahuna, and then the beach. Uh, but yeah, techno surfing, super, super classic. Uh, yeah, I, yeah. I no, it stands. It stands alongside, like, um, uh, what's the? Anyway, I can't remember the super classic twelve Bs in other areas. <laughs> super classic twelve Bs in other areas. I've done. Uh, very cool. And and so, did you first see a video of China Beach? Did somebody tell you about it? Did you see it in a guidebook? Like, how'd you first encounter? Yeah. China so. Beach? It was in a guidebook. So I knew that I had gotten into grad school in Albany. I think I found out around March. And so we were in Arkansas until the end of the summer. Well, I guess like we, yeah, until around July. And someone who had lived in Boston brought a Rumney guidebook in for me to look at because he knew I was psyched. And I looked through it and I was like, oh, you know, why mail looks awesome. And then I think I had seen videos. Uh, maybe I had even seen the movie Uncommon Ground at that point. Cause I was like doing pre preparation for like moving mm -hmm. to the Northeast. Maybe and I dosage got inside... two. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe dosage Dave two Graham as well. And... Yeah. Yeah. I think dosage two was out around then. Yeah. Dave, Joe and Luke just crushing yeah. all the stuff at Romney. Yeah. And so I think my first 
I first saw it in the guidebook and very quickly after in dosage two. And the guidebook, so I, I've, and the guidebook, this is the old Wardsmith guidebook, right? Yeah, that's uh, correct. But, which I don't have, but I do have the, the second version, the 2009 one. And I'm guessing the, the, the description is somewhat similar. So it says China Beach 514B. This is the, um, the picture has uh, Vasya on Livin Astro and Zeb on, uh, what is this? Bill Clinton, Bill Clinton I think. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Just, and that's China Beach just to the right. Um, and it says, eight bolts to the lower off. A stunning line. This was a longstanding last great problem. Underclearing the discontinuous crack up a tight overhanging groove, then dyno and crimp up the less steep head wall above. No desperate moves, just incredibly sustained. Four stars on a three-star scale. F.A. Dave Graham, June 1999. Wow. Yeah. yeah it had not been done for that many years. It's uh, a great description. Yeah. Wow. I mean, I don't know where the the dino is, but that's wait, fine. Wait. Dino and crimp. Yeah. I don't know where the dino is either. Like, I uh, suppose the Iron Cross, you can kind of jump to match. You know, to be fair, I mean, I don't want to get all, like, historical here. I think that people were freer with the word dino in the past. Yeah, like dino means dynamic. Uh, yeah, because yeah, because now there are real jumps, right? And dead point yeah. is no longer a subset of dyno; it's a separate category. Correct. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's cool. So, so then, uh, did the grade deter you? You were you were climbing twelves. Like, why? Why? Or was the grade a deterrent? Or 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 were you like? Okay, so here's the question: Were you? psyched on something like China Beach because you were looking for a 514 that seemed like the best? Or did you see the description and you thought, maybe I'll just do that regardless of the grade? No, no, no. I saw the description and then I eventually saw the route and I was like, well, I guess like, <laughs> I guess I have to get strong enough to climb this hard because this route is awesome. <gasps> um, that's, that's what it was all about. And, you know, I did use some logic in the background. I, I always thought to myself, like, oh, I think probably this grade 14 B is, is doable for me just based yeah. off of my like athletic background and stuff like that. Tell me so a bit more about your athletic background. Cause you, going back to what you said earlier, you started mm -hmm. climbing in grad school, not very early and yeah, that's in right. Indiana. And then a few years later, you're climbing 12 C, which is yeah, you know, pretty good quick. Point. So, um, when I was a kid, I started competitive gymnastics, and I did that from age six to eighteen. So until I graduated from high school, and I was pretty—I was pretty good. So I went to junior nationals once, and I won the all around in my region, which is like a five-state thing. Once, wow. and then after that, I didn't do sporting type stuff for a couple of years, and then I took up springboard diving. Um, and then I continued springboard diving while I was in grad school. And, um, I mean, trained with the Indiana university team who was like full of Olympians, not full of, but had a couple of Olympians on there. And so, you know, I was like an elite athlete in a couple of sports, one kind of youth sport and then one, uh, you know, other sports. So, and, you know, I think those sports are good, you know, maybe, uh, the strength, well, gymnastics, the strength has a lot of carryover, but, you know, a lot of people come into climbing from endurance type sports and these, and the sports I came from were, um, body movement type sports. So, you know, all of the sort of body movement, core strength type stuff has always been, um, what I've been good at. Yeah. The, uh, as we'll kind of see later when we get into videos of Michael climbing, there's some there's some kind of unique core stuff. Also the flexibility, uh, mm -hmm. I think you know getting getting that foot up higher on the move. Um, but yeah, it, anything did anything else like what else translated? Do you feel especially in those early days when you're climbing into the twelves and the thirteens? Yeah, I think I think probably just knowing how to work hard. Yeah, you know, no, knowing how to push myself um, to adapt to like training stimulus and stuff like that, I think. So here's another question. What about precision of movement? 
because that's that's a thing that I think uh, I think that defines your. That's one of the things that stands out to me about your climbing, and it's partly you spend time and you refine and you refine and you refine. But I do think you're a exceptionally kind of precise climber, and there are kind of two types of precisions. There's there's the body position and balance precision and then there's just grabbing things with your fingers which is like millimeter precision which is a very mm -hmm. unique climbing thing like or or i think of it as a unique climbing thing but i have no serious athletic background outside of climbing like do, yeah tell me if those translated yeah maybe maybe they maybe they did um but it's one of those things where like i'm i'm living it right so it's hard to separate myself out from exactly you know, what contributes to what it's like correlation um, or causation. Like, do you gravitate yeah, towards these sports? Yeah, that's right. Because that's right. Yeah. I mean, I, you know, sometimes I think of myself as being precise, but you know, other days I feel like I've never rock climbed before <laughs> and I feel real clunky. So I don't, I don't know, you know, I yeah. think maybe I try things a lot and I get them really dialed. Uh huh. Uh huh. Um, yeah, I'm not sure. <laughs> well, so you've read the guidebook, you've, you've seen the, the climb, and you've gotten infatuated with the climb. This is probably yeah. a good point for us to pause and watch a few videos. We got a lot of requests to actually show some of these videos and stuff. Yeah, that's it. a so great idea. Let's watch, some of the, let's watch some of the videos. Let's watch a new, I've got a new video queued up that you haven't seen mm -hmm. um, that's pretty well, well shot and shows the route. Here, yeah. let me screen share. Let's watch Brian Kim. So... So first of all, here's the start. First of all, one of the things I was realizing, China Beach starts on a perfect jug, but it's not a jug you can grab anywhere. There is a place for your right hand and a place for your left hand and a right foot. And it's just kind of a cool start. For sure. Goes into a pinch, perfect heel hook slot. And here, this is a little unusual. They're kind of like sharp, but good crimps. Yeah, 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 yeah little unusual sequence this is very this is very chill once you know how it goes all all the holes are good you clip that okay so here they're not going to show him resting but mm -hmm. you went no hands here like maybe a thumb that's right just pressing i have never been able to go no hands and i have not seen any video of anybody else ever going no hands despite I'm good at cheating <laughs> yeah do you remember like how <laughs> No, nah, I just leaned in. I don't know. I don't. I don't know that. I don't know. He doesn't even. He doesn't even stop there. He just I goes stayed, charges up. I stayed for a long time. Yeah, because the, the opening moves aren't that strenuous, but yeah, but they you are don't opening want any, moves. You don't want anything. <laughs> I know. Yeah, because there's no rest after this. So. Yeah. Yeah. No, I I do the the whole like you know thunder cling in the cracks and like lean in. And I I, I kind of thumb lock on the on the right hand crack and you know do all this like little fidgeting now that i'm thinking about it i think there was something i did with a foot i don't remember what it was though mm, like a maybe a small foot way out right to get a little bit more of a base something like but that yeah. just to shift my weight into a position that i could lean in so yeah, that's a, this it's a good this question position here before you head up that yeah. that's this is where the route starts like it's pretty Yes. It's pretty heady. It's like, all right, I'm going to go. Yeah, you're like looking at this big, like crashing swell above you. It's, it's crazy. I, yeah. When I think about this, right, like, um, I, I know this, this episode is about your experience, but I will say, like, every time I put my hands on that jug, I'm so, I've been so stoked. It's been, mm -hmm. you know, bad days, good days, even a little bit injured, out of shape, doesn't matter. Like, I'm always so stoked. And then right here, fear and excitement as you're going, <laughs> going up into this crack. <laughs> All right. So you get this Gaston high step. Uh, and this is, these are all like good. These are both good crimps. That's right. And you come up into this slopey side pull under cling. And this is where it's like, once you get it dialed, this is all pretty chill, but it's a little balancey. Yeah. yeah, sure comes up here that little foot swing uh he he hasn't ironed this out that much you don't swing around 
I, I know I can't afford to swing around. Yeah, I think I do a deep flag to get myself into position. Yeah, so you do a deep flag. But these are, you know, pretty I fun. mean, you're on jugs. You're on jugs. So here, that left hand is good hold, but it's slopey. You can't, like, swing around on it. And yeah. then you go up into a big jug. And then that's a tiny foot. And now you're, this is like, all the holes are really good. But you do have mm -hmm. to get the balance right. You can't just hang any which way. That's right. And you can't shake out or anything right there. Right. You cannot shake out. And then this, this is where it like really starts. I mean, that's where it starts. Yeah. Yeah. So your left hand's on a good, like kind of crimp slot in the crack. Yep. And you do this really high foot and you push up into a Gaston. And then you switch the cracks. And now you're lie backing. Mm -hmm. And now it's like the stress level, like you're pulling hard. The stress mm -hmm. level goes up a lot. The holes are really good though. They're like, you know, two pad deep. Yeah, yeah, the the size of the hold does not change, but the pressure that you're putting into the holds increases. Yeah. And, and the overall, like, stress on your body increases. Yeah, and then this next section is where there's a lot of variation on how many moves, how many foot movements, how many hand movements, what's the order. Uh, and people who are strong will just, like, inch along this section. But yeah. you, you, you found some really really nice skips okay so then that move that he just kind of uh thrutched into mm -hmm. you go to this that's the the clipping jug that's where there's this like good left hand uh fifth finger right notch and this is a especially if you're not climbing that grade which i wasn't when i was doing this kind of a stressful clip like your feet are on bad smears. You're inverted. You're pulling very hard. Your left hand's good, but not massive. And you got to make this correct. clip. You, you want to get the rope in quick. <laughs> do, do you, this is very micro. Do you remember switching the position of the carabiner? Or like. Um, I wanted it the way that he does not have it. Yeah, me too. Because you clip thumb, right? Yeah, I clip uh, thumb that way. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, you want to go quickly, like. <laughs> okay, there are so a then... lot of there are a lot of good thumb clips on China Beach. A lot of like the clipping setups are very quickly done with the thumb clip. Yeah, just like reaching your thumb across. Yeah, mm -hmm. totally. Uh, I I mean I've fallen there so many times trying to make the clip. It is safe, but it's a big fall. <laughs> yeah, and then now we're we're getting into the setup for the move. So now, there. So this is an interesting thing. I think uh, there are kind of two smears, and he there are two smears here, and they really are like smears. There are mm -hmm. little points on the wall where you can smear, and then you have to get your right foot on one of the smears and then step really, really high. Yeah. And that's it. Yeah, and if you lock in, it feels great. But if you don't lock in, it feels impossible. Like, I was able to do a little shake of my left hand. Really? Yeah, like, when I was getting close to sending, I was able to, like, do, like, one of these half shakes of my left hand before I grabbed. Before you grabbed that I was hold. just locked in. You're so yeah. locked in. Like, your knees locked in there. And if you're not mm -hmm. locked in, one, either either your feet skate off and you do this really weird, like, kind of fall where you tilt or you just feel like you can't move up you're just too off that's right to the yeah, side yeah. and you're just like there's I no can't upward move. movement yeah yeah there's no upward movement when you're locked in there's this like narrow path right through that's very smooth mm -hmm. and so then so you reach up to this crimp um no it's not a crimp it's like a i don't know like a slopey side pull or a flat side pull it feels fine yeah it's fine and then it's you switch pad. Yeah, it's like a pad. You switch feet. Go up to a sloper. It's a good sloper. Yeah, it's got a little, like, ball on it that you can crimp, like he's crimping it. Yeah, it's got some teeth to it. Yeah, it's uh, fine. The rock, I mean, what, what do we say? This is, like, schist and nice. The rock is, Ye like, really good. It maintains its bite. Really good. Yeah. It's just, you know, it doesn't yeah, it doesn't polish very much at all. 
doesn't polish. It's it's rare that rock is that high quality and forms interesting shapes. Like take rifle, correct. And most most fun sport areas is the counter example where interesting shapes, super fun routes, complete chaos. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> looks like garbage from the ground. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So he's on the sloper, little perfect foot chip there, like it was set. Right. You need it, and you go up into this side pull under cling pinch and you make mm -hmm. another stressful clip which again like you kind of want it the other way around to clip yeah it i had it the other way yeah and then here's the shake brian's shaking out just composing himself this is yeah he's that's hanging. crazy yeah this is crazy he's hanging as if he's just hanging but this requires serious foot pressure and core to like yeah 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 even appear like i didn't like do you're anything here. there i didn't stop at all so then now he's getting now he's getting into what most people describe as the the crux i guess of the route or yeah how would you, how would you break these next few moves down yeah you know, so you want to get your right foot high and that helps you like turn into this like um undercling that he's going to which is a slight side pull see that right foot he's on yeah so you turn his undercling it's got some bite and then yeah and then you turn your hips a little bit before you grab the intermediate side pull mm -hmm. and then you turn a little bit more to make the move and then you make this big move yeah and what's that crimp like it's kind of like a it's it's a it's an abrasive crimp right it's got a spike yeah that's right it's a, kind of a spike yeah um half pad maybe yep not and now great. And that move, you you mentioned you pull it to your thigh, which is kind of what it feels like. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm six one plus four, and this move <laughs> felt miles and miles away. Like I could not believe how hard oh. I had to pull and how tall I had to stand up. But <laughs> it's it's a big move. Yeah, for sure. And then now you kick up into that sloper that you had your right hand on. Yeah, some people say that foot move is the hardest move on the route. I, I say that. <laughs> and this and this right hand is maybe the worst hold on the route. Really? Yeah. Yeah. It, I, it, it's I got a little so, bit like, of a bite, but it's not good, right? Right. I don't think it's the hardest move um, or right. even, you know, one of the top moves, but it's like the worst hold. And you've got two Gastons and you got to move mm -hmm. not right, but left. <laughs> right. Luckily, you're going to something pretty good you're going to like a full pad crimp yeah and this, you can and do this a is lot where with. this is where as we talked about in the last episode the really classic moves start so correct you're going to step on this that's a i mean that's a good foot you step on that foot yeah, yeah. and you pull that foot towards you and that that brings you to this like elephant ear he uses a little intermediate do you remember using that intermediate i think i did yeah yeah you just like to tap over there that's mm -hmm. a good. That's a pretty good crimp. That's like a full pad, yeah, yeah, yeah. sharp crimp. Uh, that's where Jaws, kind of, the hard boulder, the upper boulder problem finishes, right? I think so. Yeah. Actually, uh, I think I was working China Beach when Josh Levin was working Jaws, and he was double dinoing to these crimps. That's how good. Crazy. I, I would say that's how good the crimps are, but the crimps are not that good. No, no, no. That no, move, no. which is apparently how Sharma did the upper crux on Jaws, is insane. You like launch yourself like, I don't know, a dolphin out of water and you're flying <laughs> backwards through the air and you reach out, not above your head, but in front of yourself, grab the crimp like this and reel yourself in on two heinous crimps with three finger drag. Yeah, that's great. I would say it's impossible, but I saw it with my own eyes up close. Yeah. <laughs> so you grab that crimp and then... There's a perfect foot exactly where you'd want it. Exactly. Yeah. It's like where a route setter would put it. That's crazy. And you bump up. Yeah. Tell me about this hold. Yeah. So it's this uh, under clingy overlap that depending on how you grab it, it will determine its depth. So I think you could use two fingers and go quite deep into it. Yep. Um, but I used all four fingers and just crimped it. And it's got a little bit of a lip, even if you're not going super deep. But it yeah, is yeah, a trade-off. Yeah. It, 
It was quite a positive but small crimp for me. But all four fingers. Yeah, I still have not decided what works better for me because they're they're both not ideal. <laughs> but they're both kind of good enough. So you yeah. get that hold, and as we saw in the first clip where he fell, he didn't really get it right. It seemed like he kind of got the pocket a little bit, but not quite all in there. Right. And now he seems like he's doing what you what you did, like all four fingers crimp. Yeah. That closes it down. There we go. And now you do the foot switch, and you step up on that Very spike. high foot, yeah. Very high foot. And you find the balance point. Yep. Uh, um, this that's, is a, a, that's a really special balance point too. I remember just like feeling it like it was impossible. Yeah. It's like, you, and then you find it. That foot it is facing the wrong way. So it's not, you have to, you have to f flag over farther than you maybe think you're like, is this here? But then it's there. It's totally there. And then, uh, then you get into this. Now you get this like T shaped hold system. That's quite interesting. Oh, it's really interesting, yeah. So you have a left, it's kind of a mini jug for your left hand. Mm -hmm. I mean, you, the mini jug is being generous. It's a, like a mini jug for the route, right? In, uh, <laughs> yeah. in the Red River Gorge, they'd call it a quarter pad crimp. <laughs> <laughs> in Romney, it's that's, a jug. That's not fair. There are like small holes there, but you know what I mean. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, as I recall, every finger has got its own place. It's like a little mm -hmm. crack system. Your thumbs in a little thing, like some fingers are in deeper than others. You do have yeah. to nestle your hand in there. And then it's like good, good enough to clip right. that most people clip off of it or the right hand that follows. Yeah. Uh, most people clip off of it, except for Julian, who. Oh, yeah, who skips it. Who skips it, which is, by the way, having caught some of those whippers. Insane. Like to catch that, it is safe, but to catch those whippers, I was reeling in like a little bit of slack. Yeah. And uh, Julian is like fearless climber, skipped so many clips on, uh, what is it, Cold War. But he did scream on a couple of those whippers because they're absolutely insane. Best, yeah, maybe the best nuts. belay I've ever given. Second to my belay <laughs> of you on the send of uh, Parallel Universe. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, so you do this clip. Which is, how, how is that on, on like red point? Is this pretty stressful? Like, do you understand why Julian skipped the clip or are you like, that seems unnecessary? Yeah, it kind of seems unnecessary, but I think he was probably sending faster than me. To be right? fair, I need to look so, at the video because I couldn't find it again. I don't know if he skipped the clip on red point. Okay. So it could be he thought he needed to skip it and then actually didn't, but I, I don't remember. Yeah, because by the time I was sending, I had like linked from way down low on the route several times and was comfortable with that kind of stuff. I had it really wired. You, yeah, you knew that even coming with some, having being taxed on the, the bottom section, right. could, that was not going to be a stopper. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So you make this clip, which... Again, I feel like he's got facing the wrong way. I feel like Brian <laughs> screwed himself with all most of the quick drop placements here. Like, yeah, that for sure. <laughs> yeah. And then you grab this right hand. Yeah, which is in the same system. Yeah. And it's like a yeah, like... pretty awesome finger lock, actually, right? Or it's a slot, kind of. Yeah, it's a slot. I don't know that I finger locked in there, but... I don't really yeah. know how to do that stuff. So it's like a side pull that you slide your fingers in. Yeah. So yeah, funnily, my middle finger can't fit. <laughs> so I get a two, four, five <laughs> slot, and then I crimp the edge with my middle finger, and it's weird. <laughs> okay, uh, but it's still good. Okay. Yeah. And then this is the this is where people fall. Yeah. 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 Yeah, people and fall there a lot. He lets out a little little grunt. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that's the, people call it the iron cross move. Uh, I think the feet he used out here were wet when Enzo Otto was falling a bunch on this move and was legitimately so very frustrated. Mm -hmm. But yeah, this is the victory 
This is kind of like the victory jug, right? Yeah. Yeah, I think um, it's like 510 from there. Yeah, still kind of interesting to figure out, but you, you're probably not going to fall here, right? Oh, that would be that would be terrible. <laughs> <laughs> it, it was not immediately obvious when I when I first got up there, but then like yeah, once yeah, you find yeah, the path, sure. it's like, oh, this is kind of cool. Yeah. Did you top out? No. Some some people top out. I I haven't really explored up there, but yeah, I don't know. I don't. I don't see the point. I don't want to lessen anyone's desire to top out, but you know, it doesn't doesn't add anything extra for me. Yeah, I, I agree. We have to ask Maddie about it because he said on uh, he said he topped out and then really regretted it because it's quite <laughs> sketchy up there. Yeah, because <laughs> you can get lost. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And then all of a sudden, you're at the point where if you fell, you deck because. Yeah, I was like, wait a second. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So that's the route. So very cool. I mean, let's let's watch a little bit of uh, some other videos. Maybe not in as much depth, but this is Nick Orange. Yeah, I don't even know who that is. Yeah, Romney, there's the setting. Yeah, it's got windmills now. And this yeah, is that's the start. The, that's the future, right? I think so. See here, we've got him in the start. Coming up through here. We've got a... Uh, looks pretty standard. Modern cutting to make it look like he climbs faster. Oh yeah, here's the wet, uh, the wet slabs above. This is, this is uh, the, yeah. the ledge where two other routes, uh, Muscle Beach and Butt Bongo Fiesta and a couple yeah, more yeah. start. Uh, and you get to you get a really nice vantage point of seeing people try yeah. the hard hard rats. Very cinematic. Yeah, it's pretty cool. Cool video. Here we go. Here's the crack system. Yep. Yep. They're kind of cutting through the movements here, but it looks pretty pretty standard. That move was that move is like deceivingly hard. It's like a two inch move, but it yeah. is hard. That left hand bump. Yeah, uh, <laughs> we'll get to that because that's another move that I think you do in a very special way. But most people really? kind of thrutch up into it like he did, just like Ugh. yeah. Uh, there are two people who do that move in an interesting way. You and Andy Lamb. Andy Lamb l leans right and just reaches up static. He finds a balance point and okay. just reaches, which is cool. And then I feel like you you dip down and then generate, and then you yeah, kind of carry remember. that momentum up into the move. I don't know. Well, yeah, 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 something like that. Yeah, I find that like two inch move difficult. And then I'll tell you, there's another one coming up that I find difficult. Ah. Okay, so there he is with the move there's locked that. locked in. Look pretty good. Yeah. Ah, uh, that this is a great job of showing the setting. It's just like oh, he's in the sun. He's in the sun. You got savage. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's gonna have to be really cold when I yeah. when I climb it. <laughs> yeah, that, that's sorry. more standard. Sorry, Nick Orange. <laughs> no, he's... that move right there. The which one? The like from here to here. Oh yeah, from the undercling to the intermediate. Yeah. And when you're, I was you're... working. When I was working it, that felt super, super hard, but then it calmed down when I got close. Mm. Interesting. I yeah. almost thought about skipping it because you can unwind all the way. Yeah. And but it wasn't really worth it. Julian skips it. Max Soltukin skips it. Uh, it looks very, it looked very stressful to skip it. It's like, because yeah. you have to go through two body position changes, even though in theory, you know, you can skip the holes. So, so, you know, when you skip it, you have to go from basically like you're under clinging. Yeah. Like he's really turned. He's into that. really turned to there and then extend. Yeah. And yeah. it seems very strenuous to skip it. Mm -hmm. Two, two seconds of Cedric Lasha. <laughs> So this is a uh, supernova. 
This is the Mammut Strong people from back in the day visiting Remini and crushing everything. So this yeah. is Cedric Lashad doing the move. Right, with the completely wrong hands. He's got the wrong hands. And uh, under under clinging instead of gastoning. Have you tried this? No. <laughs> no. Uh well, I didn't see this until after the fact. Yeah, nobody um, does it this way. And I was not doing the route second go, so I had time to think hard about it. <laughs> this is a ridiculous way to do it. It's so brutal and burly. Yeah. And yeah, it looks like it makes sense, but when you get up there, it makes zero sense. Yeah, it's a testament to like how strong that dude is. Very strong. <laughs> Same thing here. Same thing here. He like takes the intermediate that? and does a move off the intermediate. Yeah. Yeah. Rather than going to the good hold with his right hand first and then hitting the intermediate, he grabs yeah. his shitty intermediate and then does a heinous match. This has got to be one of the most difficult moves anybody's done on China Beach mm -hmm. ever. With the possible exception yeah. of Charlotte de Reef figuring out an alternate way past the Iron Crux. Yeah, yeah, I've heard of a couple people uh, finding alternate methods up there that sound heinous, like uh, Mike Patz. Oh. And Lizzie Asher also had some, like, V10 method up there. And most recently, Alex Waterhouse actually sent it with a oh. different method. Interesting. Uh, I need, he, he said he has a video, and he, he, he owes me that video, so we'll have to have him on. <laughs> yeah. So, Yeah. Cedric Lashat. Oh, and look at and look what stress he's in. Yeah, <laughs> still doing it. Did you encounter him when you were out there? Uh, yeah, I saw him send Live and Astro. I guess it was the I guess it was the same day he did he did China Beach. Yeah. So the story goes like this: He tried China Beach one day, came back the next day, did it second go, um, and then did Live and Astro later that day, second go. Cool. Sounds about right. He was like his... winning competitions at this point, right? Oh yeah, I think he had just won a Boulder World Cup. That's crazy. Oh, he was uh, Nina Caprez. Yeah, uh, belayed him on Livin Astro with a uh, figure eight. <laughs> what? No, 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 no. It, it no, it wasn't a figure eight. It was a uh, it was a Munter hitch. It was whatever is whatever the belay thing that you can do with a with two beaners. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I know what something that is. crazy. You get, there is a way to take two carabiners and make essentially an ATC. It's very old school. If you've ever read Rock Climbing, Freedom of the Hills, which used to be the classic <laughs> book on how to rock climb and the book that everybody had to read, they tell you all of these alternate emergency right, delays. Right, right. Which are crazy now. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. That's amazing. Wait, do you want to share kind of what... Uh, was it Jay Noah or Jay Conway described Cedric's climbing yeah, yeah, yeah. as? Yeah, so Jay Conway described his climbing that he maxed out on every move, but he was so strong that once he had both hands on the wall, he started recovering. Yeah, that's a different yeah. level. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you can see it watching him, even in those like three moves that we were able to see. Yeah. Yeah. So speaking of a different level, the Alex Magos, and I think there are kind of two sections I want to watch. The first is the crack section. So mm -hmm. he's getting up into the crack. He uses this foot that nobody uses. And now he's yeah. just chilling. And he's going to do some weird stuff. <laughs> he's just like, where is right. the body position? I don't know. Let me clip here from a ridiculous position. Grab yeah, that's crimp. like... Nobody That's like a clip you make your first couple times up because you're afraid. Yeah. Yeah. And that's a crimp nobody uses. <laughs> right, right. He's it's crossing into very a bad. bad. He's, he's skipping all of the good holes. There are good holes down mm -hmm. here. There are good holes up here. And he is currently on the two worst holds on the lower section. And he's strolling. And then it just... There's something like just gravity doesn't seem to work the same way for this guy. That's right. And then this move. So that he does like everybody else very, very smoothly. Yeah. 
I wonder, we're going to have to ask Andrew Palmer, who saw his first go, what he did there on his first go when he didn't have any beta. And I think he was just trying to on-site China Beach. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but it looks like Which he got it, a little beta. This was not much before his first on-site of 9A, so. Yeah, not an unreasonable no. proposition. Mm -mm. Um, and then if we skip forward, he's now he's in the crux. Ali. There you go. Yeah, I mean, that looked really easy. Yeah. But yeah, and then the rest is pretty easy. Uh, although he's very spanned out because he's a smaller climber. But he just climbs, you yeah. know, walks the rest of it. And that's me in the corner. Yeah, yeah. We'll get. Oh, yeah. That's that up there. That's Michael for, for scale. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> just because Alex is incredibly tiny. You are yeah. not a big dude, but you're climbing no. Live in Astro, which is the 14C just right next to it. So you had an up close view Howdy. of this, like right there. Yeah, it was amazing. Uh, do you, I remember I asked you, because I'd never. You know, I think I'd read about Alex Magos a bit. Ali, Ali. Like, what was this climbing like? Come on. You saw it up close, and I think you just said it was Ali, beautiful. Ali. Yeah, and then it looked yeah, really yeah. easy. Yeah, yeah, he makes everything look easy. <laughs> not everyone does that, right? Cedric Lashaw is also very strong, but he does not make look, things look easy. What? Yeah, what do you think goes into that? I don't know. Huh. It's a good question. I don't know if... Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> Okay, back to you. First of all, you mentioned in your blog post about China Beach that you first did Cold War. Why Cold War and not China Beach? Um, okay, so during that time, I, I was still at the point where I was working through grades. So I did that at Rumney. I knew that I had six years in grad school, and so I just needed to do China Beach before I finished grad school. So I started at the bottom. You know, the, my first season there, I did like um, um, techno surfing and whip tide, and then some other twelves, and then that eventually went into doing like butt bongo, which was my first five thirteen, and then mine too. Yeah, yeah, and then suburban, um, which was maybe my not my second 513 because i did a bunch in rifle in the summer in the middle and then i went through all the like very classic eight a's in remedy there are a lot of really good eight a's beat junkie um, uh predator yeah Qu coral c coral c um cote d'azur cote d'azur yeah 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 those um then the 13 c is kind of thin in remedy there it aren't really that many. is so i mean I the best right to you know the best one right no. It's China Beach to the break. <laughs> <laughs> it's the best 13C in Rumble. Oh, uh, yeah. I would call that 8A. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. <laughs> um, so I didn't do 13C. So I think I moved in. I did um, Urban Surfer. 13D. Yeah. Urban Surfer. So that like took me... I tried it for a fall i almost did it one fall and then came back and did it the first weekend of a spring and then i think that same spring maybe i did cold war and so, and so suburban has a different start the suburban urban, urban surfer and then cold war kind of has some overlap with those roots right yeah that's right so the bottom half of cold war is different than the bottom half of urban but the top half is the same. So it adds this like crux sequence in the bottom. The Barracuda Corner, right? The Barracuda Corner, yeah. Which is another one of the stunning patches of climbing. In Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's awesome. And so anyway, I just had, I had time at that point to build like a little bit of a base before I did China Beach. And so I took advantage of that. Um, and I think it was good. I think it was a good choice. Yeah. And um, so, so you mentioned like after Cold War, you started trying China Beach seriously. What about non-seriously? Yeah, right. Did you, did you kind of hop on it before? Do you remember what that was like? I think I had been on it a few times before. Was it yeah. just sampling? Was it, was there somebody there who was working on it? I think Keller was there working it. So Keller Renato. Yeah. Cause he started working it, um, earlier. 
and I tried it with him a little bit, um, maybe a very little bit, like a handful of tries before I had done Cold War. What was that? What did that feel like? You hadn't done 514, you're trying China Beach. Yeah, I think I was able to dog my way to the top. I don't, I don't really remember exactly what the goes were like, though. I wasn't patching anything together. Yeah. And, and so then you talk about after Cold War, you had your first serious tries on the route. It was hard, but it felt possible. I think those were your, <laughs> your words. What made it feel possible? Like what I makes... was linking sections. So okay. uh, I was able to get to the break, and I think I was able to go from the break. So you were able to get to the break, and then you were able to start making the moves above? Or no, you were able to go from the break to the top, like through that? That's right. So I was able to do each of those things around the same time. Mm. So around the time that I made it to the break from the ground, I was also to, able to make it from the break to the top. And that's not close. <laughs> um, just because it's hard to move through the break, but I knew that... Um, being able to do that was good. And then I was also able to go from like a bolt before the break through the break, maybe not to the top, but into the meat of it. So you're able to do kind of so three had, overlapping sections. Yeah, I had hang. meaningful. That's right. I had meaningful overlaps and I was able to sum it every time. Yeah. Yeah. And when you're working a rat like this, is there a... Is there a moment where you're like, this feels possible, and then you get excited and nervous? Or is it kind of a continuous process of getting more and more confident? How do you think about think... your likelihood of sending? Well, I think it depends. Sometimes it's a continuous process of becoming more and more confident. With China Beach, it wasn't. With China Beach, it was like, uh, I was kind of close not really in a fall and then um i like cut some weight over winter and then i was really close and i knew i was going to do it really fast <laughs> unpack I mean, that unpack that a bit. i know that's i know that's not a great thing i mean we're not supposed to do that in 2022 but that's that's what worked it wasn't unhealthy i was not unhealthy skinny but um weighing like five pounds less really helped how, yeah, how did you kind of decide that that was a lever you were going to try to pull? And then how did you do that? I really wanted to do the route. That's how I decided. I just really <laughs> wanted to do it. And how I just ate less. I tracked my calories. How, how? It yeah. wasn't anything fancy. Yeah, I did it over like two months or something. Oh, that's, that's pretty quick. Yeah, right? well, you know, I never, I never get that big. Mm -hmm. You know, I went from like, I went from like one sixty to one fifty three. That's not, yeah, that's that sounds like yeah, a so, significant benefit, and and yeah, so it's not. I never get that. Yeah, I never get that big. So it, it, I never really have to go crazy, and it never takes that long. I'm yeah, I know that that's a big privilege or whatever. But that's just the, that's just my situation. And I, I know this was not the only thing you did. Like uh, one of the other things I you got really into training too. I had yeah. always been into training, but I got more into training. It Describe was around the time that yeah that winter. So I had been fingerboarding for a couple of years, right? I mean, yeah. this was like 2010 when I sent the route. So I had started fingerboarding seriously in like 2008. No one was doing that. You had a ton. And you I was were like, tracking data and. That's right. I had spreadsheets and stuff. Mm -hmm. I have like hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of entries of spreadsheets of fingerboard training. Uh, maybe we'll link those. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> uh, and uh, let's see. At first, it was just kind of stuff I came up with. You know, I would do weighted hangs. You know, uh, you know, people were fingerboarding, but no one was like adding weight to themselves. So I like added a bunch of weight to myself. Huh. That's how I climbed like V10 for the first time and got really strong fingers was to add weight to single hangs. And then over the winter 2009 and 2010, that's when um, the Beastmaker came out. Oh, yeah. The Beastmaker. Beast the Beastmaker 2000. 
And I've always had like a thing for British climbing. And so I was like really into the Beastmaker because it was a British company. They know how to train. And... I, I think it rains almost all year. So they get yeah, really yeah, yeah, good yeah. at training. Yeah, yeah. Also, my, my dad's family moved here from the UK. So I don't oh, know. Oh, cool. Yeah, yeah. Um, and so I read their website and they were really into these things called repeaters, which I had never done before. So I started doing repeaters and I started doing their two finger teams training. So I would train like back two, middle two and front two and then half crimp. And then I would use the sloper and stuff all with like different amounts of weight, depending on which grip it was. Yeah. yeah, so that that was kind of the beginning of that. And that's where my tracking uh, really took off. On the Beastmaker. Yeah, on the Beastmaker. Yeah. And I think the, the repeaters really gave me the perfect sort of power endurance for China Beach. So talk me through a typical training week when you were working on getting close to, to China Beach. What does oh, that look yeah, like? Yeah, so I would... Let's see, what would I do? I think on Sundays, I would do seven rep repeaters. So this is after, maybe after climbing. Uh, no, 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 no. So um, I knew the person who made the graduate student teaching schedule uh -huh. in Albany. So I talked my way into having Tuesday, Thursday classes only teaching. Nice. <laughs> and I didn't have any classes because I was just writing my dissertation. Mm -hmm. So we had Fridays off and then Sandra was working as a nurse and she had weekend time that she had to do, but she worked every Sunday instead of every other weekend. And so we were able to go to Rumney every Friday and Saturday. Got it. So Friday, Saturday, were which your was weekends, essentially. Yeah, that was our that was our weekend, which was great because Friday was not very crowded at all. It was us and Neil M Mashawi. Oh, Neil. Awesome guy. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so any so anytime I see someone from Rumney nowadays, I'm like, is Neil there? And they don't know who I'm talking about. So I don't know if he's I know Neil. Neil. Neil's great. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, so I would have goes on the route on Friday and Saturday. And then on Sunday I would come I would do some training. I would do, I think seven rep repeaters. Wow. And yeah then i would do some power endurance on the on a home board at the gym on a home wall yeah we didn't have a climbing gym at the time in the area it had closed but we had a home wall built in the attic it was like 50 degrees overhanging and then i had a campus board too okay and then i think monday i didn't do anything or maybe it was something light and then tuesday was like four rep repeaters so with heavier weight and then hard bouldering all right yeah and then wednesday was like single hangs like max hangs or near max hangs yeah so near max hangs but not a lot of volume um and then fun bouldering at my friend's house who had a home wall and then thursday was rest mm-hmm and then Friday and Saturday when they're out. So no endurance training, which I do endurance training now, but I didn't no back endurance. then. And were Maybe you doing? I was climbing in Rumney. Were you doing weights? Were you doing core? Like other any other things? Yeah, I was doing core, um, not weights. Probably like weighted pull ups, and one arm pull ups and stuff like that. Um, but not any other sort of weights other than that. Describe your core routine. <laughs> Because you've described this oh, before, yeah. and it sounded insane. Uh, I, I, I don't know. It depends on what I'm doing at a, what, a certain time. I've always been really into the ab wheel. I do the ab wheel for my feet instead of for my knees. Um, so you're, then, you're think... on your hands, and your feet are on the ab. Your hands are on the floor, feet are on the ab wheel, and you're doing like a full no, no, body no, no, ab no. wheel? No, no, no. Feet are on the floor, hands are on the ab wheel. Ah, uh. Oh, got yeah. it. And then you're going full yeah. body and then back up? Yeah, I'd touch my nose or something and then go back up. So I've I've always really been into hard abs instead of endurance abs. So yeah. I like the ab wheel for that. Or I like these things that gymnasts call ice cream makers where you tick-tock between a, a lock-off at the top of a pull-up and a front lever. Yeah. I like those two, and I like uh, hanging leg lifts as well. 
hard hard stuff <laughs> yeah 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 um uh, yeah and i never really do endurance abs maybe i should uh, uh, i don't know the results seem to speak for themselves so okay so <laughs> you're tra yeah you're training all i mean for 2010 that was a pretty rigorous training program that's right and i yeah. know you're training and pretty systematic pretty systematic and I mean, i'd imagine you're seeing yeah you know, you're seeing progression Right. Like nowadays, there are like lots of quote unquote normal people that train hard and climb 514, but it wasn't really the case back then. Interesting. So as you're working on the route, what were the ups and downs? Was it consistent progress or were there any kind of major breakthroughs or setbacks? Okay. So I started trying it in the spring of 2009. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I had standard development on the route i think i had gotten to the point where i had gone from the middle of the groove to the top mm, okay yeah so that's decent that's kind of close right yeah so you're going through the the move in the lower crack here i'll, I'll screen i'll start screen sharing again so you you got to the point where you're going from kind of like maybe the middle the middle of this groove here yeah maybe like and maybe like right a, right around right around there or yeah. something. Maybe that stressful clip to the top. Yeah, I don't really remember totally. Yeah, to that, the top. That's yeah. pretty legit. Because then now and you got. Then, oh, this is a great story. This is a great story. Never been before told. Okay. Yes. <laughs> in a in a recorded format. I had this cyst in my lip. Oh no. Yeah, it wasn't a big deal at all, um, but it bothered me. Right. So of course what I did was took a safety pin and punctured it myself as <laughs> geniuses like me do. And I thought I had gotten away with it. And then it got very infected. Oh, no. <laughs> and I went to the doctor and they were like, w what did you do? <laughs> and they sent me to the, the plastic surgery, like emergently. <laughs> and, Oh, they no. like removed the thing and like packed it and stuff. I, you know, on this video and especially since I haven't shaved, I don't think you can see the um, uh, scar or whatever. So this happened in that spring of 2009 after I had been doing the overlap or whatever. Uh, and then what happened? Uh, and then I had to be on antibiotics so I wouldn't die, right? Yeah. <laughs> wow. But um, the antibiotics made it so I couldn't eat very well. So did you lose? Um, did you lose some weight so through I, that? So I lost some weight. Uh huh. And then had good goes on the route, but then I didn't have any energy, and then, um, like I, I lost weight and had good goes on the route, but then I also like didn't have enough energy after after a couple of days of that. Yeah. I didn't have enough energy to actually climb well. And then it got too hot. Oh, man. Was that yeah. maybe then, this, the, when you started thinking about, like, maybe I need to drop weight to send? Maybe. Maybe. Although that's, that's a pretty... I'm not totally sure. That's a very... Yeah. Um, <laughs> it's pretty obvious if you're a climber <laughs> that if yeah. you can do this, yeah, yeah, yeah. which is a big question, if you can do it and do it healthily and do it safely yeah. and without hating yeah. your life it will help climbing. Right. right. Yeah. And then in the fall, I did about the same type of thing. Like I was able to consistently just like hike it to the break and then from the break to the top. And then I would even lower a little bit like after climbing to the break and climb a couple of moves to the top. Um, yeah. But so, then so you're kind I of working on this concept of the fall. low point, right? Like how low can you start and then climb kind the top? of, but I had like climbed it from pretty low. Yeah. Did you like, I, I think in the fall I fell off pretty low, uh, just, and I was annoyed and I took it to the top from like way, way, way down there. Ha oh yeah. Yeah. And so I knew it was really possible. And then um, in this, that next spring, so that spring of 2010, I did it real fast because between all the training, all the updated training and all the fact that I'd done pretty well on it in previous seasons and then the like five pounds of weight that I had lost, I don't know, I was able to put it together really quickly. I think it was like two or three weekends. 
So Andrew Palmer was sending me texts after the last episode and said, he, quote, he, he noticed your quote, I only fell after the break two or three times. And Andrew Palmer said, everyone knows the cool thing to do is fall two or three dozen times up there. Like he really missed out <laughs> on the experience, Michael. Yeah, yeah. I made I made up for that in other routes <laughs> where I think I have the record of falling at the top of some routes and rifles, so I don't feel too bad about it. <laughs> awesome. I fell something like 13 times above the 5.8 dyno in Living in Fear, and I think that might be a record. <laughs> oh, wow. Who, who was belaying you at this point? What was the hang, hangout like on the, the China Beach ledge? Yeah, so it was pretty much just Sandra, so my wife. Um, she was belaying me most of the time. I think, like, Keller was there a bit. Keller Renato, is that how you say his last name? Um, he was there a bit, although he sent, I think, in the fall of 2009. Mm. So we were working it together a little bit. Cool. So I've got yeah. queued up um, the video of you near sending it. Yeah, so yeah, this is the day that. before. That's Sandra. Mm -hmm. So you're going up the start. And this is just so dialed. I mean, yes. Yeah. And here's where you're going no hands. Yeah, nobody does this. <laughs> Have not seen anybody in person or on video ever do this. Oh, yeah, I'm totally no hands. Yeah. You are chilling. Max does the this next kind day of when I, pinky lock. The next day when I sent, there were a lot of people there, and I think I was joking with them. <laughs> wow. So I'll skip past. Um, okay, now it starts. So you step up. Time. Boom. And this is just, you know, so smooth. This is, this is a very well-worked well route. Looks very automatic. Clips are all in the right places. Okay, so now you start to do some interesting stuff. So check this out. Yeah, so I hand foot match right there. That's one thing. A lot of people like put their foot a little bit lower, but I hand foot match. Yeah. Yeah, let's go back to let's it. Go let's go back. Get, let's... Let's, get super, let's get super technical. Yeah. This is going to be the nichest podcast of all time. Oh, yo, yeah, totally. I mean, okay. So I hand foot match right here, and this is important. A lot of people put their foot lower, but I put my left foot exactly where my left hand is. And that is, uh, um, what do you call it? On uh, kind of a, cr a good crimp. It's like kind of a good crimp yeah, slot. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. And yeah, it's yeah, high, yeah. but you get your left foot up there. It's high. It saves a lot. Yeah. You go up into... Because now, check it out. That left foot is not going to move. Yeah, so this is crazy. It's there. Flag. Flag. He's in the jug. In two... In Reach a... up. You're there. Yeah. He flags, and then he yeah. unflags, and he reaches up, and he's in the clipping jug. And then mm -hmm. you step over. Instead and of... You didn't have to use any bad feet. Yeah. And you skip all of the holes that Alex Magos used and clipped off of. <laughs> so... Yeah, all of them. So this... So Keller told me that. Keller told me that, Beta. Yeah. I mean, mine might have refined a little bit from his because he's stronger than I am, but he had the flag beta. I mean, it looks beautiful. I, and it yeah. saves so many foot movements. I've tried it, um, you know, and it requires a ton of core. I was skating, like my left foot skated several times. For me, it requires a ton of core. But I did do it once, and I could see, it, like, hey, this is way more efficient. I just, this is yeah. before I'd ever trained core, incidentally, so that might have had something to do with it. <laughs> How do you not train core? <laughs> Look, uh, I mean, I guess I did sports where, like, they make you train core, like, so much, so. Yeah. yeah. I can't really talk. I am new to sports. Let's put it that way. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But it is, it is a really cool se skip sequence. I mean, let's, let's actually just go back to see Brian. Uh, it's so it's so much more efficient than all of these others. Uh, I mean, I'm just like that's a hard part of the bottom and I was just out of it real quick. For contrast. Okay. Let's watch Brian Kim. So he goes up into the this is very standard. So he actually gets yeah. pretty high. But I don't know if it's a hand foot match. 
It's not because what he's about to do is he is about to step his right foot over to where I put my left foot. Right. So at this he's point, he's going to do that little dance move. Yeah. So he's going to do this thing where he he kind of matches and shuffles. Right there. And yep. now, after a foot shuffle and a hat and a hand match, now he's in this thing, the mm -hmm. clipping jug. And now he steps over, which I think you kind of do as well. And then at some point you have at to. some point you have to step. Yeah, but yeah, it saves like two foot movements the way you do it. Um, and then let's do another contrast in reverse. So this next move, these next few moves, getting into the setup for the move. He does a hard bump, which you also do. And then he does a very standard thing, which is he keeps his feet there, turns over his right hand into a Gaston. And this is very barn door -y. It's easier to make this move if you don't move your feet. It, it, it's quite easy mm -hmm. to get your right hand here, and that holds pretty good. But right here, you are, you are barn dooring, and you have to move your feet up. So now he kicks his foot up, and now he's into the move. Right. And then we go back to you. Uh, let's see. Bump. Foot up. And then you get the yep. move. And now you're in. Let's just watch that sequence again. Because yeah, it's so smooth. So, so, okay. Here's the, from the beginning. There's the flag. Watch Michael's body. It just goes through this very straight line. So like he's not, he's not barn dooring. He's not going back and forth that much. And there, wait, go back a little bit when I'm on the undercling, right hand undercling. So look, right when I'm on the right hand undercling, yeah. my left foot gets into that position. Right here? There, my left foot's up right before yeah. my right hand moves. Yeah, yeah, your left foot gets really high. And then this... I mean, the takeaway is, though, like, all my all my points of contact are within, like, a little box. That's, that's part of it, though. Yeah, yeah, you're within a little box, and that box... Most people, when they make this right hand move, their body is, like, here, and you're here. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so they have to barn door over and then go up. And you just keep going up. Right. Very smooth. And now, now you're just going to motor through. This way the video gets quite bad. <laughs> so yeah. as we're getting close to the send, I got a couple questions from listeners. <laughs> um, question from my friend Nick O'Brien in Maine. Michael is so thoughtful and prepared. Oh, yeah. I've never met him. We're like, uh, I think we follow each other on Instagram, but I don't, I've never met him. He's a, he's a similar training nut, although he often applies it to many things outside of climbing. Uh, yeah, yeah, but yeah. But he said, you know, Michael is so thoughtful and prepared in general, which I'd agree with. At what moments did you experience the limits of your preparation and how big a deal were those in the process of sending? If any, did you experience any limits to your preparation? Not with trying to be. <laughs> I feel like this is not a normal answer, incidentally. No, I mean, like, you know, later, um, I've gone on trips when I haven't been super prepared and I just had to, like, change my expectations. Yeah. Try different routes. But China Beach, it went. And actually, there. Hold, yeah. hold that thought. We're going to come back to that. So I got another question from Daryl St. Laurent. He's interested to know how, how did Michael approach the route differently? Because I've seen really strong climbers fail to put it together. Also true. Do you think you approach the route in a different way than, than other people? Like kind of looking back to have this kind of quick ish <sighs> sending experience. I mean, it, it's not going to sound that revolutionary now, but, you know, I was like, training apart from the route. Yeah. 
which wasn't as big of a as common of a thing back then and with the route in mind not just general training but training that's right with the route in mind but doing specific climbing specific strength training outside of climbing yeah which a lot of people just like no i'm gonna just only rock climb only get on the route i think yeah you know now obviously everyone does that right mm -hmm. but that was super helpful and rumney is a place you know there are certain rock climbing areas where training applies very very quickly and other places where it doesn't apply as quickly and rumney the training applies very very quickly because it is shorter and it's edge style climbing mm. and powerful style climbing and um like bouldering on a rope like, those are easy to train and uh, like waco tanks training applies very very quickly but rifle you know there's some style that's involved there's a lot of endurance that's involved that's hard harder mm -hmm. to train with home methods mm -hmm. um there are techniques that are harder to train with home methods but rumney and like waco tanks that's not the case probably like phantom blue i've never been to phantom blue but i would imagine that would be the bouldering area that does is not a as applicable to to training training yeah not to say that you shouldn't train, but it's just not going to be such an immediate carryover. Yeah, yeah, that makes but sense. I always found it an immediate carryover in Rumney. People would like find Big Kahuna hard, but I was like, no, I mean, you should, you're doing your campus boarding during the week, aren't you? Yeah, it's a campus crux on. Because if you're doing your edges. campus boarding during the week, that's very easy. <laughs> I don't want to like. <laughs> I mean, like, sorry, not sorry, but that's just sort of the case, right? You know, I still haven't sent Big Kahuna. Uh oh, I'm hoping to send it uh, maybe this fall. But yeah, my warm-up routine, I don't know if you remember, was techno surfing, which I had on lockdown, 12B. And then every time, every day, fall on the crux of Big Kahuna. Don't even try to finish it and then go over and try China Beach. Nice. I would do Big Kahuna into... Not into techno, but into the one on the left. Yeah. It was awesome. Yeah, I remember that. Okay. I have a question. In your blog yeah. post, this is maybe my favorite this, line at the end. This 12-year-old blog post. Oh, yeah. So <laughs> Great. I, in your blog post, you write, I'm glad I didn't send faster this spring because climbing on it was so enjoyable this year. I, unpack that a yeah, bit. Yeah. What made it so enjoyable? Is it, is that true? Well, is that true? Is the question, is that true or is that something that you write like after sending something that just took a while? I, That's the question. Mm, yeah, what makes I'm a not send? Sure. What makes a send? It, so before this, you write about the send, it was perfect in every way. Right. And I'm sure that yeah, you yeah, meant yeah. a lot of things. But then the kind of the two of the things you pulled out are. I'm glad I didn't send it faster, but it also didn't take you that long. You know, when you're... That's right. It, it took like a perfect amount of time, enough time to be like invested mm. and have it be a really meaningful thing, mm -hmm. but not so long that I got frustrated. Mm. Is that yeah. what you search for like, as like a project? All my Rumney friends were there that day, which was awesome. I mean, that's that's cool. Yeah, that was and really just cool. an extra thing that's... You know, hard yeah. to coordinate. Right. But, I mean, unpa unpacking this, like, I don't know. If I had sent it sooner, I would have done some other things, maybe. Yeah, but would you have been um, as invested in it? Would you have been as deep in the route? Would it have pulled, like, it sounds like it pushed your training and your climbing? Yeah, maybe not. Maybe not. What do you search for as in projects in terms of, how hard they are and how much effort you think it's going to take you to send. How do you think about that? Well, what do you mean? What do you mean exactly? Rephrase the question. Yeah. Okay. You said <laughs> it, it took the perfect amount of time to send. And so I'm, I'm kind of connecting this to the question we tried to answer in the last podcast, which is what makes a route good for you? What makes a project good? 
Uh, what makes a project the right mm. level of challenge? That's a good question. I think probably something where you can get continuous positive feedback by doing new things on the project, maybe not every session, but every couple of sessions, like be it making moves more easily or refinements of beta or new little miniature links or something like that. Mm. I think that's probably huge. And that's like definitely something that keeps you motivated for the project and makes it, um, it makes it keep feel feeling possible, which is maybe the most important thing is that it r remains, uh, possible throughout all of the tries. And it should probably feel more possible the more you try it instead of less possible. And if it's ever, you know, feeling less possible, that's maybe not great. I mean, once once you've taken a realistic look at it, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, I could see I could see trying something and then it feeling less possible once you realize how difficult it is. But then you can stick with it. Once you understand it. Wait, so, okay. Yeah. So picking that apart a little bit, how much of that sense of continuous progress is about you and your approach and how much is about the rep because one of the things we do when we're climbing a project is you get you get really i don't want to say creative because this is all real but you get really resourceful and attentive and detailed with how you track progress like you you start to observe hey this move felt easier i unlocked a little bit of beta like i understand something about or how to manage energy or how to manage effort in this route better than I did before. Like I got a lucky go, but now I know that it's possible to let go a little bit more on that move, right? All of these are ways we, we, you kind of construct this picture and you turn a very complicated skill tree of the project into progress, right? And that, that's like a very, um, it's a very complex thing that we do as, as, climbers because from the outside it could look like wait well, you just fell there for the hundredth time <laughs> like no but i actually made progress uh so so how much of that is something that you you bring to it versus that the route has inherently yeah uh, good question i mean the way you've just phrased it it seems like all a psychological game to keep yourself motivated maybe it's just right? you love the route and maybe that's maybe it's not yeah, maybe you just are, yeah, maybe you like the route for some reason. Maybe the route speaks to you. But all of those are real, right? real things. Like, I don't know that it's all a psychological game because I do think it requires effort and creativity to piece together, but those are all real, mm -hmm. you know, objective measures of progress generally. Like there's, there's some sure. subjectivity in how hard a move feels and, you know, what's going on with the, the conditions and your, and your how you're showing up that day, but, but uh, well, here's, here's a counter counter example. So what about rats that have a stopper boulder problem? Like is live in Astro, where is live in Astro? The right, right next to China beach, which has what, like a V11 and then a massive jugs and then like a V11, V12 massive. What, what how would you break that? I don't know if it's, I don't know if they're that hard, but there's like a boulder problem, but yeah, they're, rest. yeah, they're, they're harder. Yeah. And there's a massive rest. Is that more or less easy to see progress on? Is that more or less good of a de project? It depends on what kind of rock climber you are. Hmm. D tell me more. Right. So I spent some time on Living Astro um, and never, never really got super close. Um, I don't know if it, I, I, maybe I wasn't as motivated. Um, and maybe it just didn't fit me as well. Uh, I think, you know, I, I, I could see for like some sort of boulder, maybe that would be a better project. Mm. Um, I don't know, for me as a climber, um, you know, kind of being pretty okay at the sprinty type rock climbs. China Beach was good because it's a sprinty type rock climb and it was easy to um, get my body into the type of shape to perform well on it. Mm -hmm. 
and the fact that there's not a lot of stopper moves or there's no real stopper move meant that there wasn't like a built-in frustration. Yeah. Yeah. Like with living Astro, you could fall on that little boulder problem in the middle and you're not very tired right there. Right. And then you're like, because, I had more to give. You, yeah. Because you stand in the crack for like five minutes beforehand. Yeah. Yeah. Huh. It's an interesting. Yeah. Interesting question. I mean, if I, yeah. So like parallel. Yeah. Right. It's hard. It's hard off the ground. Parallel universe 14. A I believe Michael on the Senko actually uh yeah v10 ish mm -hmm. right off the ground yeah. crazy boulder problem and then a knee bar that you got a no hands rest in i did and i think most people don't i did and then it made the top part pretty easy. and then what 13 a slash b yeah maybe i don't know to the top yeah so i had fallen at the top a couple times before but then um, I was doing it without the knee bar because the standard thing is just to sprint through. And then the knee bar made it really casual at the top. And so, but yeah, a stopper boulder problem at the bottom. I mean, there were days, even when I was fairly close to sending where I couldn't do the boulder problem. Yeah. You know, like if you lose too much skin, one of the holds is just really, really terrible and you can't pull off of it because, you know, your seeping skin doesn't provide any friction but in china beach you can always climb on it yeah i mean right? and that you can always you can always make moves the the things you're describing are you know from my perspective i think the things that have made it so fun to be as a project even when i was climbing 13a you can always climb on it it gets like progressively harder um yeah that's yeah, interesting. Yeah, you could imagine a skin condition where you just couldn't try live in Astro, maybe. Right. Right, because the holds are bad, or you right. couldn't try right. parallel. Right. But you 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 wouldn't have that with China Beach. Do you think you could send China Beach now? You're heading to rifle. You're working on, mm. you're, you're in Zulu shape. You're going a muerte in your training. <laughs> yeah, maybe. Uh, I, I don't know if I could send it in like a day or something. I think I could maybe send it in a couple of weekends. I'm not sure. I've like climbed other 14 Bs since then. Probably not as hard, but I think I probably could. What do you think would be I think different? It still this time? fits my style. Still fits your style? Yeah. Uh my endurance is a little bit better. Yeah. Yeah, maybe I would shake at the break. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, uh okay, so the year you know the year I lived in Maine. Yeah. Um, I went up it a couple times. Yeah, what once you kind of explored it while we were climbing together and to to kind of show me some stuff. Yeah, yeah. So, um, and I think I was able to climb climb up it pretty well. I don't remember putting huge sections together, but it wasn't like a bolt to bolt fiasco. It was like fairly reasonable climbing, and I would do it uh, maybe after trying Live an Astro even a little bit. Yeah, I I recall you did. I mean, you didn't make big links, but and you were trying to keep yeah. the effort low because you were getting pretty close on. You you were doing live in Astro as the main project, and then you'd kind of we'd run down and sample parallel, and that seemed to be the way to do yeah, parallel. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah, yeah. That that year, I cleaned up a lot of stuff in Romney, which was cool. Um, but yeah, I think I think I could probably do it again if I put some time into it. Cool. Yeah. So you you had the send. It was perfect in every way. What happened after you lowered? How'd you feel? Uh, it was different. I felt great. Yeah, it was amazing. Yeah, I don't know. I was on a high for like months. <laughs> even even now, I look back on it and I'm like, mm, I, did, I did a thing. It was great. <laughs> I'm serious. And this yeah. is how many years later? It's like, uh, it's 12, 12 years, years later. later. Yeah. I mean, it was like a, it was a big kind of first goal. I mean, I started thinking about it when i was a baby rock climber 
Yeah. Right? And so sort of like a life goal type thing. Is your Wi-Fi you know, I guess password I, still China Beach? It is, yeah. <laughs> and I guess like I've climbed a harder route since then. And I feel good about that, but it doesn't have the same place in my heart. Mm. Yeah. It took longer, though. <laughs> Route, r- routes have taken longer. Routes have taken... So that's an interesting thing, because we were talking about investment, right? Yeah, easier routes have taken longer. <laughs> or lower, lower graded routes. And, and, and yeah. yet, you don't have the same investment that you did with China Beach. There's something inspiring about the route, the goal... I mean, you, you wanted to climb yeah. when you were climbing 512. Yeah, yeah. True. Yeah, there wasn't anything else that was, like, hard that I wanted to climb when I climbed 512. I mean, that that's that's uh, one of the things that I'm kind of excited to try and unpack with, you know, with you and with future guests. Like, how some, there, there's, it seems like there's something special about the route itself in addition to mm-hmm. our experience on it. Right. And then, uh, yeah, I mean, w- I mean, we'll see. I, I, it'll be very interesting to see if other people have this kind of special idealized version of the route, right? It's like the platonic ideal of a climb. Yeah. Right. And stepping back a bit, did you have kids when you uh, sent the route? Oh, no. Good. Yeah, good point. Yeah, I think I brought this up last time. So on the drive back. Sandra was like, oh, maybe we should have kids now. <laughs> and two kids later, here you and are. And she was pregnant like two months later. Okay. <laughs> That's amazing. Yeah. <laughs> so who are you excited to potentially talk to on our, some of our next episodes? And are there, are there questions you're excited to unpack with them? Um, yeah, I, so the question that I want to unpack with everyone is like, is this route as special and as awesome as you and I think it is? Well, and and we should probably lead with like you and like me is your Wi-Fi password China beach. (laughs) Yeah. yeah, Good, good point. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, How is this Um, route special? And I think the answer will definitely be yes. For some people, like I'm excited to talk to some friends Mm -hmm. like Andrew Palmer and, uh, Maddie Zane, yeah, um, who I know will both be interested in being on this experiment, and I know that they probably think that the route is special just as we do. Um, but it'll be also interesting if we can c- convince some, you know, more well-traveled climbers mm-hmm. to speak about the route and get their take. Yeah, if you do the route in a few goes, you do it quickly. Is it still as special to you? Or do you still right. perceive that it's, you know, the platonic ideal of a climb? Yeah. Yeah. I'm excited. Me too. Any other last thoughts? Um, no, I not really. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Well done. Well yeah, done. Thanks for thanks for hanging out, Michael. This is awesome. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's been great. <laughs> and thanks for listening. If you made it this far. You probably know more about China Beach than most people. <laughs> right. So go out there and get on get it. Get on it. See you this fall and probably this spring, next spring and probably next fall. 